Hey guys, welcome back to We Watched the Movie. I am Mike, and today, on the 45th anniversary of the original Halloween, we are talking about another Halloween script. This comes, the information from this, is gonna come from two different places. One of which, of course, is one of the Halloween Bibles, Taking Shape 2, from Dustin McNeil and Travis Mullins. And this book's amazing. As you guys know, we can't recommend it enough. Just plethoras of information. Plethora, that's a word I don't use. It starts with a P. You know what other words start with P? I can think of two. The other is from a recent podcast from the Dread Central Podcast Network, Development Hell, in which they talked to both Nick Phillips, who uh, was a Dimension Films exec who worked on this, and Jake Wade Wall, who was the writer of this. Jake Wade Wall is a guy who wrote the Hitcher remake. He wrote the When a Stranger Calls remake, and he's done a ton of these type of spec strips scripts and things like that, including three different possible Halloween 9 scripts that he made and sent in to Dimension when all this stuff was going on. So the script that we're talking about today is called Halloween The Missing Gears. And I've taken information from both of these, both this recent interview and from Taking Shape 2, and I've put them together. We don't actually have the script, but I put together as much as I could about this and let's talk about it because it's got so many parallels to what ended up being Rob Zombie's Halloween, what ended up being Halloween Kills, and so many ideas for the future while we're talking about the fact that Miramax has just bought the rights for a TV show, for a movie. This ties into everything in a weird way. And also, we have brand new shirt designs from our buddy Wolf of Elm Street. You can check those out in the description box below. I think they're pretty dope. I can't wait to get mine on so I can rub myself with it. So this script was while Trankius and Maleka Cod were working with Dimension and they were all trying to figure out how they were going to follow up that poop potato that was Halloween Resurrection that ends with Michael opening his eyes in the morgue. Still a possibility for what we could get in the future. I know it's a long shot, but they could just start there if they wanted to. Hey, let's just do Halloween 9. Forget this whole Laurie Strode, David Gordon Green trilogy ever happened. It is a possibility, but that was the idea at this point. They still hadn't decided to do the Rob Zombie remake yet, and they're trying to figure out what's going on with Halloween 9. The guy apparently took ass loads of different pitches, including one that sent Michael Myers to space and all this one that was literally the plot of Hellfest. It was called Michael Myers Amusement Park or Michael Myers Amusement. I think he said the file was listed as Michael Myers Abusement or something like that. It made me think of Beverly Hills Cop 3, but I'm a 90s kid. Now I'm just thinking about Michael to that hanging off a roller coaster. I mean, hell, if he could drop himself from the ceiling like an H2O, he could do that on a roller coaster, right? The guy's limber. This one's really interesting because it would jump all over the Halloween timeline, kind of like that Crystal Lake upcoming series is going to do. They, they described it as a pre remake -ule, and it was going to show Michael as a child working with Loomis and growing up in Smith's Grove during the prequel portion of it, which I think I want to say he described was about 15 pages long in the script. But this was also going to show a Dr. Loomis, a recasted Dr. Loomis, because unfortunately we had lost Donald Pleasance at that point, in his 30s working with Michael Myers, and it was supposed to be more of a hopeful Dr. Loomis, because he had this great line in this interview where he said, people don't wake up that hopeless. And I wanted to kind of show how he got there. If you're thinking about what I'm thinking about, which is Rob Zombie's Halloween, where they kind of did that exact thing. They didn't have the trailer park stuff in here. Thank goodness. They kept it a mystery and, and tied it up to the original film. But the stuff about Loomis sitting in there and talking to him and him at first being a jovial dude, kind of a hippie who just ends up absolutely depressed because he can't help, he can't break through to this kid. The guy was like, yeah, I mean, they own the script. I wouldn't be surprised if they were like, hey, you should do this because we like that part in talking to Rob Zombie. But it also mentions that while they were working on this, they found out it was going to happen when they heard the news that all of a sudden Rob Zombie was directing a remake. Or allegedly, Rob Zombie didn't want to work off anybody else's work but his own, which is the most Rob Zombie thing that's ever fucking Rob Zombie. So it's crazy. This was so close to getting made. And then you have the, the remake that ends up taking place when they just decided to wash it all away. And how many of those threads are in this? Moving on. So these scenes take place in Michael Myers' life all the way up until the moment where he escapes Smith's Grove. It shows the escape on the fr from the inside out. Whereas, you know, in the original, they just get there and everybody's just standing around with their thumbs up their ass playing Snake on their cell phones. It shows all of that up to the point where he steals the station wagon. Now we jump forward to the end of Halloween 2. Now we're jumping around the franchise. And at the end of Halloween 2, the script shows him 
Michael Myers escaping the fiery inferno that was the end of Halloween 2. Loomis has been taken away to be cared for. Lori's been taken away to be cared for. They're both gone. Michael Myers has escaped. And instead of going after them, instead of going back to Haddonfield, he goes to what this script calls his true home, Smith's Grove. And then Michael goes to Smith's Grove, the town. Oh, shit. That was just a John Carpenter. Da -da -da! He goes to hide in the town of Smith's Grove. And then we go a year past these events. So we're still back in time. Cause you gotta think we're making this during the time of resurrection, but this is taking place. And the rest of this film will take place during the events of Halloween three. It's a year after Halloween two. It doesn't talk about those events. It doesn't tie into them. It's just meant to explain where Michael Myers was during the events of Halloween three, why he wasn't in the movie technically. And as the, the writer said to what does Michael Myers do the other 364 days of the year? Ashes in my pants. Ashes in my pants. And it's interesting how they mention Smith's Grove here because that town, that actual hospital has been shut down. It is now dilapidated. It is an abandoned hospital because of the events of Michael Myers and, and the inmates escaping and who knows how many of them they actually caught. But that place has been shut down. It's dilapidated. It's abandoned. But the whole town of Smith's Grove doesn't suspect a thing. It's They're not like Hattonfield because Michael Myers never fucks with us. But as they mentioned in the interview, Michael spent more of his life in Smith's Grove than he did in Haddonfield. So he's got even more ties to there. So you have an unsuspecting town. You have Michael Myers hiding right beneath their wings. That sounded weird. Lori's gone somewhere. They've taken her to a hospital somewhere. Loomis has gone somewhere. And now we bring in our new characters. It's basically this rivalry going on between the schools, between the towns, where it's Haddonfield, where it's Smith's Grove. And you've got two of the characters, Brianna and Brad, who she's a cheerleader at one. He's the quarterback of the other one. They're not supposed to be together. And there's this weird Romeo and Juliet storyline that, that's going on through there, which I know everybody's thinking right now, and that's Halloween ends. But uh, I don't know much about it beyond that. So who knows how much time they actually spent on that. But those are two of your characters. Eve, who has ran into the path of Michael Myers before and is suffering trauma from that, but she is a doctor and they describe her as almost a Loomis-ish character who helps people get through their trauma from the events that Michael Myers forced upon them. This is getting very Halloween kills. Not as Halloween kills as you think it's gonna get. It's gonna get a lot more Halloween kills. Evil dies tonight like a Golden Corral fucking buffet. I don't think they actually say that, but you get my sentiment. The final girl's name is Langley and she's a babysitter who's babysitting for uh, Lindsay Wallace, the character of Lindsay Wallace, who they say, and I believe they say it happens off screen, dies in this script. But you know who also is, also is here is Sheriff fucking Brackett and to be played, I believe, by Charles Cyphers himself, who they say also was even starting to look like Dr. Loomis with his shaved head and goatee at that point in his career. Charles Cyphers was coming back and he was going to be the new Loomis of this. He was going to be the Ahab of the movie on the hunt for Michael, not believing that he's dead because Michael killed his daughter. I mean, it is logical. It does make sense. It's definitely better than what they did in Halloween Kills with the everyone's entitled he is running around town in a, in a cool twist yelling at the sheriff of the town saying that no you don't understand michael myers is here he's still alive and the sheriff not believing believing him which is a total flip on that was him and loomis back in the day there's apparently a panic room scene in this where bracket uses a panic room to escape michael myers and the way they describe it as one of their favorite scenes in the film where michael's image shows up on like one of the t tv monitors when he's not looking at it and you can see him from behind which sounds pretty cool but the panic room thing does make me think of the sliding shelf in halloween 2018 which is like it's not a cage baby it's a trap now, if you can forget those movies from your mind and scrub your mind clean of it, it's actually a very interesting idea to have. And I don't know how Charles Cyphers would have been in this role. I don't know how that would have played out. But it's a very interesting storyline to have him be the new Loomis-ish character and be obsessed because it all lines up here. They mentioned in this interview that there were several moments of, they didn't say it this way, but almost fourth wallish to me it sounds sort of fourth wallish where bracket someone will take michael down and then they'll go to look and bracket will be like he's not gonna be there kind of like throwing right back to the end of halloween or other points where they, they'd be like he's gonna pop up any moment now kind of like they know they're in a movie and they didn't say it directly that way but that's just the way i took it especially in the scream universe that we were living at in this time in the world 
What's also interesting is that Michael has a purpose here, something that we were very unsure of for a, a lot of these recent movies. Michael had a purpose in that it becomes clear that his goal was to clean up his mess, to finish off the events of that night but not just Lori, everybody, everybody he encountered that night, uh, maybe their families as well. And of course, anyone who gets in his way, like Steven Seagal at a buffet. Someone comes across at the abandoned Smith's Grove where Michael's been living. They come across these files that show that Michael has these files and he has all this information about everybody who he wants to, to kill and, and their families and whatever, what they're scared of. All these things. They're not very clear in the interview about how he got this. If he went out and like stole this from people's houses or like if it was just there in the mental institute, maybe people's personal health files for some reason. But the point of it is it kind of adds a new wrinkle in, in Michael's whole thing is that he was reading these. He was look, he was reading these files and information on the people that he wanted to kill. I don't know how you feel about that, but it's always interesting when they add those little wrinkles into it. The sky. And that's kind of where the whole movie ends. It ends at that hospital because you've got these kids coming from these schools to do their Halloween ritual and they get there and Michael's there and he's fucking waiting. And Sheriff Brackett shows up as well to chase after Michael. Michael kills some people. There's one scene apparently where he murders somebody by sticking a needle in their ear. That's pretty gnarly. There's the, the way that they mention they use Smith's Grove as kind of a character in there and kind of the, some of the freaky shit and dilapidated shit that's in the abandoned hospital was pretty cool, including one scene where they had these hydroshock tubs and they were full of this black, disgusting water and sitting there and a character had had to go underneath the water to avoid detection by Michael Myers. Michael eventually impales Sheriff Brackett on this broken piece of railing. And as everybody goes outside, he grabs Michael and pulls him into the, the piece of the railing too, stabbing him in the stomach as well. And they're left alone together, which is funny because what we all know, one of the things Jay wanted from Halloween ends is for them, Lori to pull Michael down into a fire or something and, the, and they could go down together. It seems like this is kind of what was happening in this moment with Sheriff Brackett. He was impaled and pulled Michael into his death javelin alongside of him and then they go outside to the cops and they see a gurney coming out they're hoping it's going to be michael and it's of course sheriff brackett but he does live and of course michael myers is gone to to hunt and stalk again but allegedly at the end of this they wanted langley to survive and they wanted sheriff brackett to survive because they wanted to continue this with even more sequels and have michael continue to try to finish his work which is really interesting to me and again i just want to mention that this alongside of multiple other scripts like halloween retribution which would have brought freddie back for a cameo kill which may have brought the character of john tate back uh, which kind of had the same idea that we're going to have Michael Myers finish off all the victims from his previous movies. Only this one is far more Halloween kills ish as the, as far as he wants to kill the adult now adult members of the people that escaped him in the first movie. But all this was on the table until Rob Zombie showed up on the table with fully bearded and all. And they decided, Hey, this is all too convoluted. We don't know how to canonize this anymore. It's just getting all over the place. And they said, Hey, we're just going to remake it with a with someone who's the complete opposite of what the franchise has been so far, uh, what the original was, and really shock people with that and kind of restart the whole thing. And Rob Zombie's not going to work with anyone else's work. He's going to do his own thing. So this was just, all these were just kind of dead in the water. But it's really interesting to think about this script and however you feel about that. I think watching Halloween Kills now, pre-Halloween Kills, I bet a lot of people would have been like, yes! That sounds fucking awesome. We get a flashback. We get a period piece. We get a, a, tie, a direct tie to the original two movies. It, it fits canonically in the H2O timeline. Like, what more do you want? And it also eschews the whole Lori thing. And, and we, get a, we get to see young Loomis. Um, had we not seen Rob Zombie's film use some of the stuff from this script... At least it looks that way. Had we not seen some of these events take place in Halloween Kills, this sounds like the perfect Halloween 9. Uh, in a lot of ways, it really, really does. So I'd love to hear your all's thoughts on it. Tell me what you guys think down below. I'm fucking fascinated with it. Should they do this now? No, because of all these things that have already taken place in the franchise. But it's super interesting to think 
had they gone with this at nine, where would we be with the franchise now? Would we be on Halloween fucking 14? Having no Rob Zombie movies ever exist? No David Gordon Green movies ever exist? It's wild to think about. I'd love to hear your all's thoughts. And I love your all's fucking faces. I hope you have a great day. Check out those shirts down below. And we'll see you guys super soon. Happy Halloween ish almost here comes that white faced fucker an asshole like no other he's a big old piece of shit wants to stab your sister's tits cause he's a white faced fucker Loomis can't recover Dr. Challenge drunk again sleeping with your sister's friends do you want to know about the darkness? I said god damn god damn you fucker Halloween never ends, suck my fucking dick, and I don't really care what Blumhouse fucking says. Put him in a box, or suck a fucking cock. You can say he's dead, but we all know he's not. Yeah. So let's go trick or treating, let's go fucking drinking, let's all go in pumpkin head on VHS.